Hi and welcome to Bioretech Specialist webinar. My name is Lauri. I'm the Marketing and Sales Director here at Bioretech. I want to welcome you to this webinar, which is live. Either you can watch it via Vimeo or via Facebook. Please subscribe and uh, answer, uh, ask your questions for our specialists to answer. Today's topic is uh, new concepts of uh, distal radius fracture uh, operated with bioabsorbable Activa pin. Our specialists today are uh, Professor Weinberg from uh, Austria. Hello, Professor Weinberg. How are you doing? Hey. Hello. I greet everybody all over the world, wherever you are sitting. Perfect, perfect. Uh, and another specialist, uh, Dr. Marcel Varka, who will have the main topic today. Well, Dr. Marcel Varka from Hungary. How are you doing, Dr. Varka? Hi. Hi, Lauri. Professor Weinberg, nice to see you again. I'm a little embarrassed because when I've been to Graz uh, 17 years ago, Professor Weinberg was a very famous professor then. She's still very young now, but I'm a little embarrassed because <laughs> I have to talk after her. But I hope I will grow up for the task. Thank you, oh, Dr. Varaka. Sure. So, a little bit about uh, Professor Weinberg first. She will have an introduction to the topic. Her background comes from uh, lots of experiences in, in trauma and orthopedics and pediatric orthopedics too. Uh, she now works in uh, Graz University Hospital, does re research there, and is a leader of uh, trauma study group from EPOS, European Pediatric Orthopedic Society. Uh, further ado, Professor Weinberg, please introduce us to the topic. We are all over the world. Hello again. Um, as you know, distal radius fracture, first slide please, makes 20% of all fractures. It's not coming. Ah, no, we go, we go, we go. Next slide please. Um, today we want to talk a, bit, a little bit about distal radius fractures, and you know we have always a little bit discussion about um, the treatment conservative or operative. I just have today the job to introduce a little bit in the topic. Next slide, please. And as you know, 20% of all fracture in children are distal radius fracture. When we look on the classification, we have to say the main um, fractures are in the metaphysis and um, can touch the epiphysis as salta uh, one or two, but never are uh, transverse to the um, joint. So epiphyseal fracture are very rare in distal radius fracture. Next slide, please. As you know, when we are talking about children, we have shortly uh, talk about Crohn's phenomena. You know that we can have premature closure of the physis. This is more or less fade and it's very rare. You see here uh, a case, it was co uh, treated conservatively and by the time it developed a Crohn's arrest. We have on the other side, stimulative Crohn's disturbance which is relevant in legs, but not so in arms. So we can neglect it, this. Next slide. The most important Crohn's phenomena is the spontaneous correction. And as you know, there is a big, big potential because the distal radius epiphysis makes 80% of the length of the arm. Here you see four, four days old female patient with 60 degree of deviation. Next, next slide, please. Next. And you see this could be remodeled completely and you don't have to think about it. You just need to immobilize a little bit. And after five days, you can just let them move. Next slide. If we are talking about pro and co, the first question is always, did we need an intervention because of functional deficit in this radius? And there exists a lot of old literature. Next slide. But if we are looking on the function, we know that if the fracture is distal, the crossing over of the two bones, we never have any functional deficit. So in literature, um, it's not, it's, it's, um, it's written that we have no functional problems, even if we have some deviation of 30 to 40 to 50 degrees. What we know, it's also that the um, 
for um, computer simulation show us that um, the ulna is not fixed and this is uh, why we never have any functional problems at all. Next slide. So we have to summarizing that crossing of the bone is never a problem and means that we have no, uh, crossing of the bone makes it difficult. So the problem of functional deficit is always in the proximal shaft, not in the distal. So this is not an argument for operative treatment. If we go on, next slide please. Then we have to talk about treatment and treatment efficiency. As you see here, we have a complete distal radius fracture. Next slide. This colleagues decided to do reduction and you see it's not a good reduction, but they accept it. And you see after one week that they have a slight re-dislocation because, because it's a complete distal form fracture. Next slide. And so they decided after one week to make a cast wedging after 10 days. And you see, after again one week, they have this X-ray. Again, they have a deviation of 25 degrees. Next slide. And then they decided, it's coming up to 35 degrees, then they decided to do key wire osteosynthesis. I don't want to criticize it, but what we can conclude is that sometimes in conservative treatment, we have a high amount of expense to treat those fractures. Next slide. And now we, re, uh, we have to say, if we want to have um, arguments for osteosynthesis or for conservative treatment, we have to see what does it mean regarding the success. And we are here have to say, yes, both have the same parameter. If you need a reduction and if the reduction gets a secondary dislocation. In total, the operation time is 22 minutes. If you operate, it's 37 minutes. This is depending on the, uh, on the surgeons. But nevertheless, these are big studies. So success alone is not the criteria to say you have to operate it because we have this great spontaneous correction. So what could be an argument for operating? Next slide. In our opinion, in our um, country, we said it's a patient's demand. He wants, if he need an anesthesia, this is recommended. If you have a complete dislocated fracture, Marcel will go on this topic later on. So if you have a complete dislocated fracture, shortening, both bone fracture or single radius fracture, the patient's demand is if he need an anesthesia, he wish a definitive treatment. So in our opinion, unstable fracture should always be fixed if they are still unstable um, in the operation room. Next slide. So in our country, we say distal forearm, we have to say if it's stable, then we do conservative treatment without any reduction. If it's displaced, we have to check if it's stable, then we can um, go on with conservative treatment and cast, but if it's still unstable, then we do a definitive, definitive treatment. I hope I give you now next slide, a little short introduction to the topic so that every distal radius, radius fracture more or less get a quite good result. This might be not the indication for operative treatment, but be aware that expense of treatment and also for the patients to come go to outpatients department and get at least after, like see on the last slide, after 16 days and definitive treatment might be not optimal. So I hope that I give you a shortly introduction to the topic. And now I would like to go uh, to give over the microphone to Lauri. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Weinberg. It was an excellent presentation and introduction to the topic. Uh, next, the main uh, presentation of today from uh, Dr. Varka. And Dr. Varka comes from the Pervi Hospital National Trauma Center from uh, Hungary, Budapest. He is the vice president of Hungarian Pediatric uh, Trauma Society. 
and a board member of Hungarian Trauma Society and also a ATLS instructor. Uh, Dr. Varka, please tell me and tell us all about your view and use of Activapin in the distal radius area. Thank you very much. Thank you again the opportunity that I can be here and talk about our operative technique. Please, if I could see my presentation. Thank you. Okay, we can further. Thank you. And further, next slide, please. Thank you. So, as Lauri said, I'm working in the Peter Fee Hospital. This is uh, in the capital of Hungary, in Budapest. This is a great hospital which has a small department, the pediatric trauma department, which, which department is dedicated for pediatric trauma patients. And we operate more than 1,000 patients a year and about 80 till 100 operations due to distal forearm fractures. Of course, there are much more distal forearm fractures in our practice. It's about 2,000 yearly. As we can see, we operate 5 till 10% on all distal forearm fractures. Next slide, please. And in our practice, we operate only or mostly severely displaced fractures, which means there is a two-sided periosteal rupture and some kind of shortening as well. And of course, sometimes we operate fractures with secondary display displacement, which are out of the range of the remodeling capacity. And of course, sometimes we have to deal with open fractures, which are also candidates for operative fixation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when we decide that we should operate a child, there are many aspects and many expectations. So it should be a minimally invasive operation. It should be very stable. There should be no repeated surgery. There should be no long hospitalization. It is an expectation of the parents. And there should be no late complication like growth disturbance, like infection, like skin irritation, and it should be well tolerated by the child. And I think it is very important there should be a very early functional recovery. As we have heard, these fractures show a good tendency to heal, but the question is how fast we reach this state. Next slide, please. And the gold standard operative procedure of distal forearm fracture today, even today, is percutaneous key wiring and cast application. This is the most accepted and most widespread operation method worldwide. And supporters of these methods say that it is low cost, it is simple, and there is a low rate of complication, but we can argue, next slide please, I think every surgeon who has ever treated a patient with percutaneous key wiring and casting after can know that this operation is not without complications. It is somehow a mix of conservative and operative treatment because key wiring itself is not stable enough to hold the fracture together without a long or short arm cast. And the ends of the wires can cause skin irritation even if they are left outside. The infection rate can be even higher than if we bury the, the wires under the skin. And sometimes we can see migration of the virus. Sometimes we can see turn tendon or nerve injury. And uh, it is not a very comfortable operation. There is at least a four to six weeks of immobilization after the operation. And the rehabilitation is not so fast. Next slide, please. Here in this picture, we can see a case when the wire is migrated and there is a little ossification between the bones. So it is a problem, I think. There's a need for a greater surgery as we planned before. Next slide, please. And there's a special problem as well. This is the area of the diametaphyseal region. In this area, we cannot use the conventional key wiring. Of course, we can try to wire these fractures, in our practice, we don't like to go through the physis. Of course, 
there is no evidence that the physis, uh, if we cross the physis, there will be a growth disturbance. But next slide, please. Sometimes, from time to time, we can see growth disturbance. Most, most authors suggest that in the case of diametaphyseal fractures, we simply could go through the physis because no evidence that the risk of a growth disturbance is great. In our practice, we don't like to go, we avoid the physis when we can. So these are the facts why we, uh, a long time ago, we wanted to find a new solution, a new way. And next slide, please. And a few years ago, we have found a solution or we think we have found a solution in 2017, our team has published a short double elastic nailing of severely displaced distal pediatric radial fractures. This was a new modified technique. Next slide, please. When distal severely displaced metaphyseal or metadiaphyseal fractures can be osteosynthetized with two pre-bent and relatively thick pre uh, elastic titanium nails. It was a modified elastic nailing technique and today, uh, after a few years, we almost totally abandoned key wiring of distal forearm fractures. Next, time, next slide, please. Uh, we can, and there are many modifications already of this technique. Of course, we can use one nail. Next slide, please. We can use a nail in the urna as well. And we can use soft tissue protectors as well. And next slide, please. And of course, we can use double nailing techniques as well when the fracture is very, very unstable. Originally, we described this technique. Next slide, please. And there are many advantages of this technique. The main advantage that it gives us and it gives the children a very early and brain free immobilization. And of course, there are disadvantages as well. Of course, there is a moderate risk of skin irritation because of the protruding ends of the titanium nails. Of course, there is a risk of tendon irritation, but we haven't seen this complication frequently. The greatest problem with this technique is that the nails should be removed with a second operation and under a second anesthesia. Next slide, please. So this is why we wanted to improve our technique and we wanted to find a much more better solution. And this is when, next slide, please. The idea came that we should replace nails with biodegradable nails. And considering the fact that we are using biodegradable PLGA material nails uh, or pins, since more than 10 years, we thought that these Activa pins could be good to replace the titanium nails. PLGA is polylactide co-glycolide, is a well-known material since three decades. It is more and more widespreadly used in orthopedic surgery. And until now, there was no any special adverse reaction. And I think it will be, or at least this is one of the material which will be the future of biodegradable implants. So, next slide, please. Here we can see an interoperative picture how we replace the nails. And next slide, please. I would like. And uh, can we start the animation? Here we can see uh, how uh, the technique itself. First, we make a close reduction. Of course, sometimes it is not achievable with a simple manual reduction. Then we have to use a blunt-ended wire to make a perfect reduction. After our reduction is perfect, we make a radial step incision. And first, we are making a titanium elastic nailing according to our previously mentioned technique. And after our osteosynthesis is good, we remove the nail and we replace it with an active pin, the most thickest one, which we'll, we can, and we place it into the place of the titanium nail and we remove the protruding end. Next slide, please. 
and uh, the video please start it and here how it looks like in the real life this is a six years old little girl with a distal metaphyseal and shortened fracture here we can see she is in a supine position and first we are making this percutaneous lever maneuver to reduct the fracture here we can see under fluoroscopy how it looks like so there's no need to open the fracture to make or reduction and we can see that the fracture is very unstable so they decide to make a operation and now we bend the nail this is the short nailing technique and after we insert the nail we can remove the nail only if the synthesis is perfect and the axial alignment is perfect we check it and after we form the biodegradable pin the similar as the by, by as the titanium nail so we replace the pin we replace the nail with the pin with the pin and we insert the biodegradable nail it should be very very tightly fitted and it should hold the fractures together. Here we can see the procedure. It should be exactly in the direction of the elastic nail. It should be placed in the same way. And now we can see that there is no displacement. The fracture is stable. And we check it again. We see if the end of the nail is not protruding. We are making a manual check as well. And when the fracture is stable, of course, for one day, we can use a plaster. Here we can see this girl after two days of operation. And after two months, he can use his hand without any problem. After one year, we almost, uh, the fracture has healed and no sign of the implant and the implant is almost invisible. Next slide, please. And here's another patient, a six years old boy, a very similar fracture, distal metaphyseal radial fracture. Next slide, please. We stabilized it after elastic nailing. And here we can see the main problem, the main difficulty of this technique. That under fluoroscopy, we, the, the, the active pin is almost invisible. So it requires a very careful surgical technique because we don't see this invisible nail, so it should be placed exactly in the same direction. This is the most difficult part of the operation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And here we can see the post-operative AP x-rays at the third wound, almost no sign of the fracture, and the place of the implant became translucent. This means that an ossification has begun and the nail slowly hydrolyzes. Next slide, please. Here we can see a 12 years old girl, a very distal metaphyseal fracture. In her case, I think there is no great remodeling capacity, considering the fact that she is 12 years old. Next slide, please. And we stabilized it again with a 3.2 millimeter in diameter biodegradable pin. We can see where this was a very distal metaphyseal fracture. Next slide, please. Here we can see the post-operative x-rays. After one year, almost no sign of the original implant. Next slide, please. And we have made an MRI scan as well to confirm that there is no excessive bone hydrolysis. We can see a black strip in the bone, and this means that this is the place of the implant, which began to hydrolyze slowly, but no, very imp no sclerosis around the implant, no excessive bone hydrolysis, and what is very, very important, no sign of growth disturbance in the physical area. Next slide, please. And this was a completely displaced fracture, a 10 years old boy. Of course, in our practice, we usually don't recommend to fix the ulnar fractures only if it shows a great displacement. Ulnar fractures shows a good remodeling capacity. The main focus is always on the radius, but sometimes, as in this case, next time, next slide, please. It was stabilized with another active pin as well, 
And here we can see the MRI scans that after half years, there's no sign of growth disturbance, no sign of visceral, visceral injury and no excessive bone hydrolysis. I think it is very important in our practice, we experience that older fractures when we try to wiring the ulna, the physis of the ulna is much more sensitive than the physis of the radius. So we try to avoid the physis of the ulna. And here we can see there is no touch in the physis of the ulna. Next slide, please. And here is a very special case. I think this is a 16 years old adolescent boy with a coagulation disorder. According to AO, it could have been a plate osteosynthesis with an open approach, but considering his blood coagulation disorder and considering that he's got only a few or one year of, of uh, remodeling capacity, we first saw that we tried to do our minimal invasive technique. Next slide, please. The difference was that we made the osteosynthesis with two radial biuretic activa pin. One was inserted from the radial side and one was inserted from the Lister's tubercle. Next slide, please. After operation, we have made a CT scan to confirm that the nails or the pins are in good position. Here we can see that the reduction is anatomic. Next slide, please. And after half year, we can see that the fracture has healed and uh, no sign of growth disturbance. Again, next slide, please. And what will be the future? Currently, bioactive nails are available. These are special nails with similar uh, material. This is PLGA material, but they have a bio-labeled, bio-labeling in the end. This is a tricalcium phosphate. And perhaps uh, currently they can be used only for diaphysal fracture, but I hope in the future we can use this biolabeled nail in these fractures as well. Uh, the main point that it uh, facilitates the surgery, the surgery is much more easier, can be much more easier with these biolabeled nail. I'm going to show an example. Next slide, please. This is a five years old girl who, girl who has fractured both of her forearm. Of course, if, he, if she would have fractured only one arm, if it could have been a conservative treatment as well, but considering that both of her forearm were fractured and it was in late spring time and a long plaster cast should have been needed for her, we decided to operate both of her forearm. Next, uh, we can see that uh, uh, on the left side there is a, um, a rather diaphysal, diametaphysal fracture, but it is rather diaphysal. Next slide, please. So the left side was stabilized with a biolabeled Activa nail. Here we can see the biolabeled end, and here we can see that even under fluoroscopy we can see where the nail is. It is exactly in the medullary canal. So the surgical technique becomes much more safer with this technique. Next slide, please. And the other hand was stabilized, the other radius was stabilized with a, an active pin according to the previous technique. Next slide, please. And here we can see the X-rays after four, month, four weeks. We can see this biolabeled end as well. Next slide, please. And we can see that uh, there was a little need for short removable brace, uh, two short braces, and uh, this gave her a very early pain-free mobilization. Next slide, please. And I'm going to show some uh, functional videos. This little girl was operated four weeks ago. We can see that by now she can move her wrist without any pain. Uh, we can see the wounds. This is really a minimally invasive uh, operation. Next slide, please. 
Here we can see a little boy, six years old, after one week, one week of operation, even the uh, wound is dressed, we can see, and he can move his arm without any brace, without any pain. Next slide, please. And the last video of mine, please start the video. Here we can see a little boy of 10 years old. Even he can shake my hand. I'm sorry that I'm sad that this video doesn't work, but even he can, he can move and shake my hand. He can make circular movements as well. And without any pain, he's after two weeks of operation, we can see. I don't know why it is so slow now. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so summarizing my, my uh, presentation, we wouldn't like to suggest that every fracture should be operated by this method. I think not every fracture is candidate for this method and there are no long-term results. There is no evidence that this technique would be superior to other technique. We have only one year of follow-up, but we have follow-up with many patients. Uh, I think it is always an individual decision if this biodegradable implant should be used. And biodegradable implants cannot be used for every fracture, but we hope and we believe that the use will be more and more widespread worldwide. Thank you very much. And the last slide I would like to ask. Thank you, thank you for your attention and thank you again for the opportunity that I, I uh, could be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, nice to see so many cases and uh, examples of what kind of uh, treatment you have and which kind of patients you use it, the Activa PIN. Uh, at this time, we have a discussion and question and answer section. So uh, after the short break, let's go to the discussion session. Perfect. Welcome, welcome back. Um, thank you again, Professor Weinberg and uh, Dr. Varga for your presentation and introductions. We have received lots of questions to our uh, email sales at biotech.com, which you can also use after the presentation if there's some uh, questions you want to ask from our specialists afterwards. However, we have received uh, many questions already. Uh, let's go through a few questions first. So, regarding the technique, Dr. Varka, what are the age limits uh, that you have for, for this technique? I think we shouldn't talk about age. The main point is if the growth plate is open. Our oldest uh, child was 16 years old, as I have shown in my presentation. I think we could try this technique if the growth plates are open in every case. So not an age, it is the state of the growth plate. Okay. Uh, yeah, there was the one 16-year-old ad adolescence, but uh, you consider the 16 uh, being the uh, at the higher higher end, uh, 18 year old 20 year old that would be that would be too high for this technique uh, i think again uh, it can be used even in a 17 years old if uh, he looks very unmatured but uh, after the growth plates are closed this technique cannot be used i i don't think so uh professor all the patient for the I'm, I'm sorry i mean we can it. summarize that we have no experience with uh, more uh, older patients. Yeah. Yes. 
which is also more difficult because you not can accept any deviation, so it, it's more tricky. There exists the Kapanchi procedure, and we don't know. Maybe it's also an option for it, but we have no experience about this. All right, thank you. Uh, another question was uh, regarding this technique. Do you have similar? Do you use this similar style in other indications with bioabsorbable uh, Activa products? Yes, we have a few cases. Only we used uh, bio active appeals in distal tibial and proximal tibial fractures, but uh, we haven't got many cases. But theoretically, I think it can be used. Okay. Yes. Then, uh, regarding the technique, uh, what kind of uh, measures do you do deciding the implant size? Is it always the uh, 3.2? You should mm -hmm. use the biggest one you can use. So we the have thickest at least three point two. The thickest one. Which, oh, excuse me, Marcel, you your part. Uh, yes, Sorry. in our practice, we used the three point two millimeter in diameter. We also use the two point seven and sometimes the two millimeter implants, but the thickest we can because we use thinner nails only if the medullary canal is very very narrow but the thickest one is the best one. Uh, there was a question, I think you a little bit um, already asked that, but what about skin irritation? Do you have any, any problems with that, with this technique? Yes. Uh, the main advantage of this technique that we can sink the protruding end below the level of the bone, so we usually don't seen any skin irritation. Uh, we have seen a few patients uh, when the protruding end were palpable because the cut was not so per perfect, but uh, interestingly they haven't caused any skin irritation. So until now we haven't seen skin irritation with this technique. Uh, we have operated many patients with this. Thank you. Uh, maybe we, have few, maybe we should, should be one comment. If it's still after cutting too long, you can take the hammer, like also Marcel said, and trying to to to, to push it down. Yes, yes, the hammer yes, the yes. We, the hammer well is always a solution. Yes. <laughs> In trauma surgery, a hammer is always a good solution. Okay. That's okay. why it's coming from my person. <laughs> we have we have you uh, also uh, live questions coming. Uh, one moment. Uh, would you use? multiple pins in the distal uh, radius fractures for stabilization if the patient is, is very big and obese? Yes. At least uh, the... The... Yo, sorry, at Professor Weinberg. Uh, yeah, at least obese patient has no thicker bones. So it's depending on the uh, medullar cavity. So um, the maximum is might be two pins. I think it's more difficult to to insert only three pins. You know, this is not regarding to obese. The bones uh, are. I, I think the question so is the two. size of the bones. Perhaps the size of the bones. If the medullary canal is very is not so narrow, like in an older patient, as I have shown, we use maximum two nails, two pins. We can use and uh, it uh, increases the stability, yes. Okay. It Excellent. is always an individual decision of the surgeon, I think. All right, thank you. Uh, one question also came uh, live. Uh, do you ever cut the pin in, in half while, during the operation? Uh, sorry, once do again, you, I, I, I don't didn't understand it perfectly. Yeah. Do, you, do you cut the pin shorter as a shorter versions during the operation yes yes we can and there is a special uh, cutter for uh, this instrument so we can cut the pin when we would like yes but uh, yeah, just have most to time there is no need for it no need for it because it is a short pin mm -hmm. seven centimeters yes yeah long. yes you have to be aware that you have to use a T shark on instrument. So if you cut it too short, then you are not able to insert it. So yeah. this is you have to be caution because the activa pin is not so long like an intramedullary nail. 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Regarding uh, the intramedular nail that you use prior to the Activa pin, is that some kind of a special uh, device you use or regular OR, OR uh, instrument? Uh, of course, uh, there can be used the special device, but we, for this technique, a regular device is sufficient. If we would like to use Activa pins in the way as they are planned, there's a need for a special instrument. But for this operation, a very regular instrument, which is good for titanium elastic nailing, is sufficient. So we need only the implant. Okay. Uh, thank you very I much. I also want to... Please, yes. Dr. Uh, Professor I Wager. have also a question to, uh, to Dr. Varga because I think it's important for our audience. What do you do, what do, you do when you have the feeling that there's coming an infection or superficial not really nice wounds and you have the feeling might be you get an infection. What's your strategy? Also, if the infection is coming after two weeks because whatever the child has done coming back and you have the feeling maybe there is something. What is your option then? Uh, up, to, up to which time point you can uh, up to which time point you can remove the nail? Fortunately, so far we haven't observed any infection, even superficial infection, we haven't observed. But I think with more time and with more patience, there will come the day when there will be some kind of infection. That is uh, uh, that is uh, low. Uh, I think in this case, it depends on, on the severity of the infection. Uh, if the, it is a short infection after a short time, then we can remove the nail and irrigate the wound as uh, as we have to do. And if it is a late infection, then we have to drill over this nail. But so far, we haven't seen any infection. We don't have experience. What's the situation if there is an infectious complication? I have to tell you that we are using these PLGA implants more than 10 years for other fractures. And until now, we haven't seen serious infection with these implants. Uh, then a question regarding the operation time. How yes. long does this take compared to basic uh, technique with titanium nails? The average operation time is 20-25 minutes. But uh, the longest one was 50 minutes. And always the reduction was the most difficult part. If our reduction is perfect, then the technique is very easy. So we have to have a perfect reduction. With longer operation time, always the reduction was the most difficult part. Yes. Uh, then one question regarding the physis, the growth plate. How close uh, do you dare to go to the, uh, near the growth plate uh, while inserting? Very close, <laughs> very, very close, because these are distal fractures. So we have to be as close as we can to the physis in a proximal way. So it is one or two millimeters uh, close to the physis. But as I have shown in the MRI, and today we have, we have made many, many MRIs, we haven't seen any, any problem with the physis, even if the implant is one or two millimeter close. Okay, excellent. Uh, what about uh, when you twist the implant? Has it ever break down when you when you bend it uh, to get the perfect alignment, like the titanium nail? No, and and the great great uh, thing that uh, the property of the Activa pin is very similar to a titanium nail. It is formable and it shows some kind of elasticity as well. So we never, ever, ever observe the fracture. Okay, thank you very much. If we return here, I can show the Activa pin. This is a real size pin that we have here. It's the 3.2 uh, and 70 millimeters. And if we get a close up here, I can bend it accordingly with my hands or you can use a proper tool like uh, Dr. Varga uses with that 
but if we uh, look at it now, it remains in this uh, shape and uh, it will not return back to the original shape uh, when, when bending or it will not break. Yes, and uh, there is a very other very important thing that I haven't mentioned that uh, this PLGA implant uh, swells uh, 3% uh, to its original size after insertion in the first 24 hours and it gives a much more stable hold in the fracture. So it is another other uh, thing why we should use this implant. Uh, and might be the, um, um, now we might be, we also have to discuss a little bit because I'm an old one, you know, I have seen a lot of you are not. polymer yeah. things. And, <laughs> and we really have to say that this generation of PLGA has a complete different um, reaction to the bone than the PLLA, which makes um, much more problems to the tissue and also to the bone. This is something we have to point out because if uh, somebody has some years of experience, he knows that every old surgeon said, oh, 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 no polymer pins, I had a bad experience. So this is completely different. It's not brittle anymore. It's, it's, it's smooth. You can bend it. You can't break it, but it's also uh, better to the tissue and also to the bone. Yes, the foreign body is reaction great, is also not there. Yes, this is a great it's fear when I'm talking with older surgeons, not with you. Uh, there is a great fear that perhaps this implant can cause some kind of foreign body reaction, bo excessive bone hydrolysis. This is why we are making MRI scans to confirm that no such reaction. And until now, we haven't seen any of these reactions. Thank you for bringing the MRI up. We just uh, last week received, received a study from Salgrenska, Gothenburg, uh, Sweden regarding uh, Salter osteotomy and uh, the use of Activa screw cannulated in that. So that study is, is out now. And there are lots of uh, MRAs uh, you can view and compare and, and see the uh, results. Uh, one, one question regarding the cutting technique. Uh, you can cut it with pliers uh, also, or do you need always this special, special device? What we have now, if we take a close up, uh, what, what we have also in the video is this high temperature cautery, which will cut it yes. nicely. What do you recommend, uh, Dr. Varka? I recommend this device of yours because it is much more easier, much more safer, and the aiming is much more uh, exact. But if you don't have this device, more or less, you can you can put it with a with a simple instrument. But uh, with this device, you can make the edges uh, very smooth. So this is why it won't disturb the skin, even if you left a little protruding uh, part outside the bone. But then take the hammer. Yeah. Then, then take, take the, hammer. the hammer. Always, yes. always a solution. At the end. It's always important to get the uh, implant uh, flush with the bone. So don't leave any protruding heads in it. Yeah, that's the, that's the main message mm -hmm. there. Uh, one question is also about the cost compared to titanium implants. Yes, this is an evergreen question. Of course, these implants are much more expensive than a key wires or than a key wire or even an elastic nail. But if we see the overall cost that not so many checkups, no need for a second intervention, no need for changing the cost, I think that the, uh, finally we will see that the cost will be lower, the overall cost. But of course, everything depends on the, of the financial uh, opportunities of, of, uh, of the health system of a given country. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, one question uh, also uh, regarding the post-operative protocol. Uh, do you have a same post-operative treatment method for all patients or uh, is it separately uh, regarding the age group or how do you how do you do, th do that? Uh, more or less we have the same post-operative protocol. 
we usually don't give a long arm cast. We never give a long arm cast. We give only for one day a short removable splint. After that, we change it to a, a removable brace. And this brace is on the child at least uh, uh, one till four weeks. Uh, at the latest, after four weeks, this uh, removable brace can be removed uh, totally. But there are children who are much more braver and they can abandon this brace after two weeks. It is always depending on the, on the uh, uh, feeling of pain of the child. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for explanation and uh, going through the protocols. We are close, closely uh, ending, ending our time with this webinar. Uh, Professor Weinberg, is there any uh, questions you would like to ask from Dr. Varga or, or topics you want to discuss? I just want to say thank you also for showing such a lot of case. I'm, you know, somebody who said we have to fight for a better life of children. So it would be wonderful if we can can get experience with this material and this fracture type because I think it it uh, changed a lot of discussion doing a lot of congress, which means what is better re-reduction, which is happened in one third of the patient, or it's better to do a definitive treatment. And in the moment where we don't have to remove any implant, I guess this discussion could be calmed down. And for me, I think it's a, a step forward to have a better treatment options for our child. Thank you. Thank you very point. much. I think this was the best sentence, finally. I cannot add anything. <laughs> Yes. Dr. Varga, thank and you. And if thank any, you anybody is interested in the technique, as we can say, I'm very glad to answer any questions, of course, via Bioretic. Thank you very much uh, for, for this, both uh, Professor Weinberg and, and Dr. Varga. Uh, viewers, please remember, if there's any questions that just are popping up uh, and you would like to know the answer, feel free to send them to sales at bioretech.com and we will get the, your question to Professor Weinberg or, or Dr. Varga and get you the answer you're looking for. Uh, please leave your feedbacks and comments. Uh, our, or contact sales at, at biotech.com to leave those comments. Uh, next webinars are in September, where we also go forward with pediatric trauma with uh, uh, former president of EPOS, Professor Las Combs. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to Bioretech's uh, specialist newsletter, where we will always send you the latest updates uh, about events, studies, and, and products for you to view and evaluate. Uh, thank you very much for everybody uh, viewing and uh, stay safe during this uh, difficult time around the world. Again, Professor Weinberg, Dr. Varga, thank you for participating with us and uh, your excellent presentations.